uh, the highlight of the day, John Couch. So John was the 54th employee at Apple. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go, I'm not going to, no spoiler alerts. I'm not going to give any more information than that. We're going to uh, uncover uh, your career path, uh, truth questions, and Q&A. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it means you've lived an incredible life. Yeah, it was quite a ride. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and there are books available, and, and John's here. He'll sign them for those of you who are interested. Uh, his first book, My Life at Apple, very spicy, lots of great anecdotes, uh, lots of, yeah, wonderful anecdotes about Steve Jobs and just and John's relationship with Steve Jobs. Yeah, more important, it's a different view of Steve than, yeah. than the traditional authors have. You know, they've tended to focus on the on drama. His, yeah. Uh, on his uh, business side and not the human part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was it was nice to see a different side of Steve Jobs <laughs> through that book. And another phenomenal book, Rewiring Education. Uh, this is such a great topic. Uh, it's the, the way we educate our kids K through 12 doesn't make much sense anymore. And uh, visionary in, in connection with that, you, you saw that coming a long time ago. Yeah, personally, uh, yeah. And it's tough. Ironic that we're at Cal Poly because Cal Poly, in a sense, is challenge-based learning. Yep. Yeah, learn by doing. Uh, so welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Uh, we also have uh, quite a few people watching us virtually. So if there are any questions that pop into the chat, Madison will let us know. Um, and as you all know, most of you have been here before. Super fluid, open to Q and A throughout the session. It's much more interesting if we get the, the questions coming as we go. So feel free to you know just raise your hand, jump in anytime. Uh, it'd be great to just uh, have you guys get involved and and take advantage of John being here. Um, so you know this was a question that came up. So I, I read both books. Um, something that you mentioned out the door at the very start of this book uh, is. You went to UC Berkeley. You were in the first graduating class in computer science, so the very, very first out of Berkeley. Uh, and back in May 1969, there was a student-led anti-war demonstration going on at Berkeley, and it was it was pretty significant. Um, it became known as Bloody Thursday, and you stated that on that day you felt that societal change was more likely to come from technology than from demonstrations. It, yeah. it triggered something. Well, so was, what were you thinking yeah, at that first time? Of all, it was one of this many, before, compu before yeah. personal computers, right? But it, before, it, first of all, it was one of many demonstrations. Okay? Right. This one happened to be a, about the People's Park, where 53 people were hospitalized and, you know, a little chaotic day. But I was fortunate enough to have access to it seven and a half million dollar controlled data computer up at Lawrence Hall of Science. And while I was sitting there, you could see the tear gas and all the craziness that took place in, in Berkeley in those days. And I thought to myself, whoa, I'm sitting in front of what will change society. Uh, and um, it's actually interesting because in the film they did with Steve, they credited Steve with that with that thought but that's the way you know the that's world the works yeah. <laughs> but i really sit i sat in front of a seven and a half dollar million dollar machine uh writing compilers and getting an instant turnaround which you didn't get in those days you had to submit your deck of cards and wait 24 hours for somebody to submit them to the machine and return your your results and i just thought this you know someday this will be i'll have one of these yeah in fact, in fact that was that was the desire yeah. As a computer scientist back in, you know, in seventies, yeah, you know, um, when can I have my own? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you at that time were you already anticipating? We we, we talk about you know a lot of our startup founders are, are visionaries, right? They they see things before other people do. W were you already sensing the impact it would have as far as um, how it could influence? Uh, you know, I I knew that the from a, the hardware perspective that because of Moore's law that technology was going to continue to you know innovate get smaller get faster uh the the challenging part was the user interface mm. and and that's actually what I wanted to do my doctorate on was human computer interfaces uh how to how to someone like my dad take advantage of a of a computer Mm -hmm. uh, so 
I think I understood more of what the problems were than the solutions at the time. Right, right, yeah. right. So finding that, you know, knowing that there were problems that needed to be solved. Yeah. Problems that needed to be solved, right. Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, one of my one of my quotes that I talk a lot about is that when you see with your eyes, it's called sight. But when you see with your passion, it's called vision. Ooh. And so I think the, the key ingredient to, to all of Steve and myself was we had this, we had this passion. Uh Steve, Steve uh you know, called it the mental bicycle. Right. In the sense that he thought that, you know, and I'll always remember this because he used this to recruit me. He goes, John, everything I own, the car that I drive, the house that I live in, the clothes that I wear, the food that I eat is through someone else's contribution. I want to give something back. And he saw technology as as a, as a mental bicycle, as an amplifier for our, for our intellectual ability in the same way a bicycle amplifies one's physical ability. Mm -hmm. And and that that was his vision, and uh, I think that's still true today. Even though you're, you know, we've mm -hmm. been a three trillion dollar company, as we still see technology to improve our lifestyle. Is well, let's, let's talk about that. So, is that what convinced you? Because you graduated from Berkeley, you went on to work at HP. Mm -hmm. uh, your mentor yeah. was. Uh, um, well, Bill Hewlett. Bill Hewlett. Yeah. How? So you you had this great career, good job, good salary, uh, great mentor, and you mentioned that Steve Jobs came sort of knocking at your door. How did he convince you to leave HP to go join a startup <laughs> that was still? Yeah, know? I think it. You know, when you're looking back, and you know, we like to say you can only connect the dots of your life looking back, and in a sense, that's how I started the book because I looked back at all the circumstances that actually led me to the opportunity at Apple. And I think there was, there was, it was both HP's fault and Steve's uh, um, incredible um, just charisma. Mm -hmm. And at HP at the time, your salary was based on what they called curve 68 and curve 68 kind of went, kind of went up quickly and then it leveled out and it was based on years since first degree. So, you know, this was early in the computer days. There were no, you know, there are very few schools were even offering computer science. And, and I was hiring, you know, students from MIT and Berkeley and Stanford and Michigan and Carnegie. And they were young and they were aggressive and they, they could out-program, you know, people that had been sitting at those desks for 10 to 15 years. And yet I couldn't pay them yeah. because they were low on the, on the curve, on the x-axis. And so that was, to me, that was a problem. And the second thing is I could see myself in 20 years. I didn't like what I saw, mm. you know, based on the restrictions and, uh, of this curve 68. And then the, then the other aspect was actually uh, my boss at Hewlett Packard was Tom Whitney, who's known for the first handheld calculator, the H335. And he had taken a job at Apple as their vice president of engineering. And so he had set up a luncheon at his home for me to meet Steve. And Steve was 20 at the time and I was 29. And so I wasn't, I wasn't old enough where I had set in my ways and I still had, I still had dreams. And um, so I met Steve and, and he was unlike any person I'd ever met before. You know, he, uh, he was still quite a bit of a hippie in those days. He still was always barefoot and, his Levi's always had holes in him and his t-shirt was always soiled and, and, and dirty and his hair was long. But he he had this mesmerizing style about him. It was like, you know, say meeting Robert Redford or something, you know, um, to use an, a motion picture analogy. And he, and he was a dreamer. And he, Steve always uh, communicated with what I call picture words. Mm. He always drew pictures for you so the mental bicycle was was a picture you know um i'll give you one more example we used to do brown bag lunches at stanford university where we would sit at stools and the students would come in with their brown bag lunches and one time a student asked steve um what what is that what kind of people are is apple looking for and you know my mind was, was an analytical mind and it went to well undergraduate degree in in this and in engineering, science, computer science, and an MBA, you know, and before I could even get the thought out, 
Steve said, you know, think of an ice cream set at Sunday. And I go, okay, where is he going with this one? You know? <laughs> and he goes, it's not the two scoops of vanilla ice cream. It's not the chocolate sauce. It's not the whipped cream or even the cherry. It's the few nuts on top. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so that's how Steve explained what, you know, Apple was looking for. And, and so he, you know, you always, you got his point across really well. And so when he talked about, you know, the mental bicycle that we have God-given talents that allow us to build tools that amplify our physical ability, why not our intellectual and our creative? And create, creative was was really the key because I had young young kids mm. and, mm. you know, you can see the, the creative nature hadn't been pushed out of them by public education yeah. yet. Can, so, you, can you talk about that experience? Actually, it's reminding me of that story you told about uh, he let you borrow a... Oh no, he, you know, oh, he, he, uh, he, um, a computer and you're, so I, you know, son. I met Steve and I liked Steve and I was a great, you know, I, but you know, I'm, I'm going from HP where I was just, just being promoted to manage the lab, which should have been the youngest lab manager in the company and, you know, 140 people. And Steve was offering me a job to manage no one <laughs> and to work for a 20 year old kid and take a pay cut because at that time, no one made more than Forty thousand dollars in the company, because Steve um, Steve didn't want you to, to join the company for a financial rewards. He wanted you to join the company if you shared his vision of what we could be. And so uh, I was I, I he was asking me to take about a thirty thousand dollar pay cut and go from managing one hundred and forty people to managing no one and to work for a you know a hippie. Um, and uh, so I said, you know, I, I share your vision. I know, I know exactly what your you you know the direction you want to go. Um, remember, at the time I was, you know, uh, I had done a year and a half PhD work, so I had a lot of computer science experience. And uh, and I said, just let me think about it for the weekend. And and he showed up in my house on a Friday night, and with an Apple II, and he put it on the kitchen table and told me then five-year-old six-year-old son christopher you you can have this if your dad comes to work for me <laughs> so that you know that is so typical of steve right steve did not lose arguments very often so really it's it's but it's chris who really it's your yeah, son so again, what happens hey, the, TV, you go work the tv didn't go on the whole weekend and this little guy got on this mental bicycle and went places and did things that i didn't think a five six-year-old was even capable of doing and so on Sunday night, I said, you know, Chris, uh, don't get too attached to it because I, 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 I you know, if I, I, I may have to return it. He goes, well, why that? I said, well, I don't take the job. I got to bring it back tomorrow, tomorrow. And he just looked at me and he said, well, just say yes, dad. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, th there's, it's kind of interesting because there are other stories of, of Chris uh, that impacted things that I did at work. I, I remember going to see Seymour Papert at MIT who, who did Logo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I brought back this application environment for Chris. It was probably about eight or nine at the time, maybe 10. And I said, look, Chris, let me show you how to how to, how to to build a box. And you know, I I defined the coordinates for them and, and, and they're finding a box. And he looked at me and goes, dad, why can't I just draw it? <laughs> and I thought, you're right, this is a computer it can compute the coordinates based on your hand stuff. Now this is back in the eighties, right? I mean, and and yeah. so that, that led to Lisa draw. Yeah. You know, well, let's break that down. Uh, Cause that's a really, really interesting story. So, um, well, okay, okay. Talk about how you got involved in the Lisa project. So Lisa was a code name for the first enterprise computer. Uh, yeah, sorry, question. Um, it might seem obvious, but what was the actual tipping point where you said, you want to proceed? That Monday? Were you like, I, I, you know, I, I would say, I don't know if there was a, a tipping point as much as a, a, a stacked column, you know, where I was fascinated with Steve. I knew that he was, I knew he was right on that, that, you know, when I left HP, you know, I had to go all the way up to the top and, and 
and they said, well, you know, you're just going to a game company. And I'm going, no, it's it's not a game. You know, it's a it's a personal computer. In fact, you've got about five of them in the company. You've got one in your data terminals division with a Z8 process. Z8 process, you got one in Colorado and your calculators, you know, you got them all over the company. You just you just have yeah. not had the vision to see the market for a personal computer. You know, it's kind of like, you know, Watson when he built the IBM computer, they asked him how big the market was, and he said seven computers. Yeah, uh, and this was this was the more than traditional thinking of at the time. In fact, it, you know, distributed systems was the big thing. People were trying to, you know, connect multiple small computers to form a large computer rather than thinking about, you know, mm -hmm. that and, and and they, you know, to some extent they were right because when I you know did go to Apple, and you know when we talk about the challenge that Steve gave me because you. You pretty much had to be a programmer to buy an Apple II, because you know there were no third-party software companies. There was no app store mm -hmm. there, you know, and so you either had to program in DOS, or you had to program in BASIC to, to make the machine do anything. And so that was the limiting factor. Was he, Steve, had pretty much sold an Apple II to every engineer in the country, right? Mm -hmm. And he was saying, "How do we? What do we do now? How do we make this more?" User-friendly. User -friendly. How do we get people who are not engineers to be able to use this? Applications, of course, mm -hmm. was one of them, which was my future responsibility. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, I think it was it was Steve. It was the vision, Steve's vision, which coincided with the you know what I thought the direction was going. It was the comfort of Tom Whitney, mm -hmm. you know, a good friend of mine and my former boss at HP, being there. Um, but it was still a, it was still a challenge, you know. In fact, I remember the president of the company on my interview asking me, he goes, "What do you think our biggest challenges are?" You know, and I said, "Well, one, manufacturing. Can you make an, enough of these? I mean, that you know, that's a challenge in, in itself." And I and I said, you know, the second was you know the, the marketing challenge of, of finding the right product that would people would find attractive to expand the mm -hmm. size of the market. But the biggest challenge was, I said, you guys even know how to, you don't even know what the software is. You don't know how to spell it because they had no software, mm -hmm. none. They had two, so what I would call utilities. One was called data mover, which moved, which moved um, uh, content, if you will, data from a cassette recorder mm -hmm. into memory. And, and there was another similar utility like that. And those were written by kids that came to work at three o'clock because that's when high school got out, mm. you know? And that was it. In fact, when I was made vice president of software, those two threatened to quit because they didn't want to work for a, somebody that was, you know, had yeah. degrees. Yeah. Um, so actually on that note, uh, back then a sort of CEO of Apple was not Steve Jobs. A lot of mm -hmm. people, uh, CEO of Apple was Mike Scott, mm -hmm. physics major out of Caltech, uh, who had worked with Mike Markula, who was the, who was really who put the money up for Apple. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I mean, it you go, it goes way back, but you know, when Woz designed his computer and was given it away at the Stanford, you know, home group club, Steve saw the opportunity, and so he went to uh, uh, Atari. He was doing part-time work at Atari. There's a story about how Woz designed it and Steve got credit for it and got the money for it. But he went to Nolan Bushwell, who was CEO of Atari at the time, and said, how do I start a company? And he said, well, you you got to have a you got to have a business plan uh, and you got to raise money. And so then he went to Don Valentine, who was one of the original VCs. And, you know, I mean, you got to you got to picture Steve and Woz coming in there smelling bare feet, you know, <laughs> And you know, Don just said, you know, out of my office, man, you know. And uh, so finally, he, he said, we go talk to Mike Marco. You need a business plan. Go talk to Mike Marco. Mike had already retired. Okay. Mike was, was a USC grad. He was at Intel. And Intel was one of the first companies to offer stock options. Nobody knew what they were. Mike went around and bought everybody's stock options. Wow. So it's like everybody in this room has a thousand shares. They're, you know, they're not worth anything today. They may be worth something in the future. Mike goes around and says, you know, 
I'll give you a thousand bucks for your shares, or I'll give you five thousand bucks for your shares. So he was already a multimillionaire at 30. Okay. And so he, and so Steve, so Mike saw it. Mike goes, Oh my God, and build a business plan that said we will be a billion dollar company in five years. Well, no one was ever a billion dollar company in five years, but Mike did that. And Apple became the fastest growing company in American history at that time. Mm -hmm. They'll probably do multiple billions by the time we're sitting here this morning. Yeah. You know, yeah. But Mike saw it. And so for, I think he put uh, $90,000 for a third of the company. Wow. And he guaranteed a quarter million dollar uh, credit line at the bank, which when they never touched. Wow. And so he became a third. And so he didn't want to run the company. He, want, he was more, he liked programming. So here you have this, you know, VP of marketing writing a, a software to manage his finances, okay, mm -hmm. when I met him. And, he, and, and I think one of the reasons that I hit it off so good with Mike was I was a programmer and he always, you know, wanted to talk about his finance program. And then he had brought his friend from, uh, from uh, National Semiconductor, Mike, got to run the company. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. was there until... Black Thursday. Oh, right. Which okay. is when he fired a bunch of people. Right, right, yeah. right. I remember that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was at Apple, Black Thursday at Apple. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so do you, do you want to talk a little bit about the the coming together of Lisa, the Lisa computer, and how that actually led to the Mac? Yeah, the it's uh, kind of, you know, it was an interesting day, time because even before I went to Apple, my my mom had a uh, Venus de Milo, a women's health club. Um, and I'd go home and my dad was lamenting because oh, yeah. he yeah. just, he couldn't, he didn't know how to manage the business. He didn't know whether, you know, when the subscriptions were expiring. He didn't know whether it was the ads or mom's personality that brought people in. He just didn't have a handle on the business. People would sign up for a 90 day subscription and then that was it. And so I said to him, I said, you, you know, do you ever think about writing a program? you know, putting this on a computer. So things are automatically fed to you. And he goes, can you do that? And I go, sure. Well, at that time, the only computer that was re readily available for retail was a, what we used to call the Trash 80, TRS 80. And it was ugly and it was heavy and it was black and it was just, you know, not very attractive. And so I said, for 600 bucks, you know, we can write an experiment here. So we went down and bought it, and I brought it home, opened it in the living room, and a cockroach ran out. <laughs> it was made in Texas, by the way. And uh, my mom said, get that out of my uh, uh, living room. So we put it in the garage. So I wrote him a, a program to manage his business. The problem was he wasn't a programmer. He couldn't edit anything. And so every time I went home, whether it was Christmas or whatever, I'd end up in the garage. <laughs> you know, making changes to the application to help him run his business. And so that was sort of the saying, how how do I build a computer such that my dad can use something like that? And so I wrote an article called Datagramming. Data, yeah. And where where we would have sets of data and you could manipulate that data outside, um, not as a procedure or in language, but more of just as moving user, things around. Yeah. And so when I when I saw VisiCalc, you know, Dan Brinklin and Dan Faustra, who wrote it to solve an academic problem, uh, I went, wow, this is the closest thing that I've seen. And so I gave them free, I gave them Apple IIs. I said, let's implement that on, on the Apple II. Well, that was the impetus that just that took the Apple II business sky high because it allowed the non-programmer to solve problems. And mm -hmm. so you know, where companies were paying $500 for an application to do financial analysis or any kind of analysis, here comes this $1,000 computer that, mm -hmm. that could do it, it right? Yeah. And so you you would find that it, it's an interesting story because um, you'd find that people bought it bottom up. It didn't go through the, you know, the department, to, the mm -hmm. purchasing department. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I... When I when Lisa was uh, when we built Lisa, I built a special room called the Sneak Preview Room where I had six of them running different applications, and I invited 
Fortune 1000 presidents in to see the future. I asked him one time, I said, how many Apple IIs do you guys have? And he goes, oh, you know, I think we probably have a couple hundred. And, uh, you know, this was before, you know, messaging and anything, mm -hmm. right? And the phone rang one day and he goes, I was really intrigued by your question. So I went back and I started to, to gather the data. And he says, we've got, we got over 10,000 and, oh. and we're still counting. The point was individuals were buying them, to be not the corporations. Way. And that was Apple's success until networking. And when networking came in, it, they took it out of, and this is true in education too, they took it out of the decision of the teacher to buy it for the classroom to, to you know, yeah. to help people with drill and kill or to give some, a student who's way ahead an opportunity to do something. When networking came in, it came out of the individual buy and went back into the IT. Corporate. Buy. Yeah. And yeah. that's kind of when we struggled in those mm -hmm. in those years. Because mm -hmm. that was owned by IBM. Yeah. Yeah. Uh and is that so uh it's reminding me of that anecdote about uh Bill Gates coming out to visit. Yeah. Do you want to talk about that story? Because that's pretty <laughs> fascinating. Well, Bill's a Bill's an interesting guy, and uh obviously uh yeah, that's it, when I look back at that. So, you know, Bill was, everything was based on DOS. And uh, it, I guess it kind of goes all the way back to Gary Kildall. So Gary Kildall had a company in, 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 Car in the Carmel area, and he was writing compilers and software operating systems for the Intel project. And I had made the decision to go away from Intel to go with the Motorola 68 a thousand because it did it did virtual memory mm -hmm. in hardware and i knew that i was going to bring on higher level languages in order to encourage people that i knew who were working at hp to come over and start writing applications for the for the apple world so ibm you know when they decided they would get into the personal computer they flew to, to carmel to meet with gary kildall and gary was flying his plane and his wife was in the office and they said, IBM is here and they want a license. They want you to build an operating system for them. Uh, but they want you to sign a non, you know, non-disclosure agreement. And he goes, well, we don't do that. And so they they, left, they flew from Carmel to Seattle to meet with, meet with Bill Gates and Bill Gates being the businessman that he was, saw the opportunity and, and entered into a contract, which he eventually pulled the rug out from him and and went solo with the operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, they became somewhat, you know, com competitors. So when, you know, we're jumping around here, but when the Apple made the decision to, to uh, take me from vice president of software, which was the sort of the technology that was driving the, you know, the user interface and the graphical user interface, to being the general manager for that product, mm -hmm. you know, the manufacturing, the marketing, the engineering, you know, Steve was a little bit upset because he wanted that. Mm -hmm. And yet the company just didn't feel that he had had the acumen or the experience yet to run a large division. In fact, he was probably HR's nightmare, <laughs> you know? Um, and I, sometimes I think to this day, they, one of the reasons I got hired was to be the adult in the room. You know, um, but uh, and so he went looking for a product and he, you know, found the, the Macintosh, which was nothing like it was. It was kind of an Apple II like product. He was searching in house. Oh, was, yeah. Like, all over the who's place. Working yeah. on what he was trying to convince yeah, everybody yeah. that, you know, sometimes I and I say it in the book, sometimes I kind of wish maybe that, you know, I had just let him run the run it and we would, it would have been more personal then we built that for corporations. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we didn't even have a sales force. So what were we thinking that we were going to sell a $10,000 computer without a sales force, right? Yeah, that was the original price tag. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And uh, because the, the beauty of the computer was the integration of all the software. It wasn't just, it wasn't the hardware. I mean, mm -hmm. I could have sold that as, a, as we used to call it, Lucy, the dirty Lisa, you know, <laughs> which would just be a, a Unix-based box. And we probably would have sold a ton of Unix-based boxes at, at that price. But uh, anyway, so Steve, uh, 
Steve decided, you know, and the, the picture that's on the cover is 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 a bet. And that's the that's yeah. it was a five thousand dollar bet that my product would beat Steve's product out the door. Because you were even though, though, even though he, he didn't do any bash. software. Yeah. He was just doing hardware. So he went to Bill Gates to get his applications. Whereas, you know, I my recommendation to Bill was to Steve was. Why don't you take a subset of our operating system, a subset of our applications, such that the Mac can be used at home and the disk can be brought into the office and you can have interchange with the work. But I didn't, you know, want that. Yeah. So the idea is Lisa was for enterprise. Yeah. And, and, home. and, you know, because see, 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 compatibility to Steve was, and standards was the antithesis of, of innovation. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, you you make the standards by being creative was mm -hmm. was his philosophy. So he didn't want anything to do that. So he goes to to Bill Gates and he 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 makes a deal with Bill Gates and Bill Gates will write his word processor and his spreadsheet for a dollar a copy. Well, the, the typical financial arrangement in those days was at least fifteen percent royalties, you know, which probably meant fifteen dollars a copy at minimum. And he came back to the executive meeting and said, I just made the greatest deal in the history of mankind. And I said, no, Steve, you just sold the corporate jewels. And so I had to show Bill Gates the Lisa. And I brought him into the sneak preview room. I curtains, opened up the curtains. There were six of the machines. You know, you could print anything that was on the screen, which was also revolutionary in, in those days. And, you know, and Bill just, could, you know, he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. How'd you do that? How'd you do this? How'd you do that? And so, and then I had to give him two, the first two off the line, wow. or early off the line. And he had went back, put him in his, his secret room. And the rest is kind of history, right? Well, when I retired from Apple, Bill called me and said, you know, we're in this lawsuit with Apple over the, over the rights to this machine. Could you come and spend a day with me? You, you flew out with your son, right? Yeah, and I said, and so I told Chris, I'm going to go up and see Bill Gates. And well, Chris knew Steve. He knew, you know, he was yeah. he knew everybody. And, and in fact, Chris, one of Chris's first summer appointments was with General Magic, which is another incredible story. But I, he go, can I go? And so I flew up. Bill met us at the airport in his Lexus. And um, the whole back of the car was books, just yeah. books. And so he shoved all the books aside and put Chris there and we drove to his to his office. And uh, um, uh, it's hard for me to say this, but uh, before, you know, before he started pumping me for information that could help him in the lawsuit, which is kind of ironic because Apple never called me, right? Uh, he said, you know, he looked at Chris and he said, you know, he goes, Chris, he goes, uh, I, want, I want you to know the impact that your dad has had on this industry. He said, when he showed me Lisa, he says, I thought my company was dead. Mm -hmm. And he said, I, I came back to Seattle and I, I ripped everything and put all the focus on those two machines that were in that, in that closet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bill didn't have to say that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, it was, it was a good guy. And I've stayed in, I've stayed in, in, touch, in, with in touch with him yeah. over the years. because. But that's, that's, John, that's so incredible. Like what, what you created. Uh, well, let you know, me just, you know, I had a well, team of people. Yeah, but in fact, the it, was, it was the, the foreground to yeah, Microsoft. Everything, and everything, yeah. Mac, it's, well, it's insane. It's all, yeah. And it's ironic that uh, on the 29th, the Tech Museum in, in Silicon Valley yeah. is doing a 40th birthday of Lisa. Oh, and they're bringing everybody this, this back. Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to go because I don't want to drive and spend a night, but I'll do a bit, I'll do a Zoom for them. <laughs> But uh, and I want my team, the guys that make that build it. Yeah, you got you got to realize that. And I think we, there's one chapter in the book which is a little bit more technical, and it shows the technology that was in the Lisa operating system, including multitasking. It was 25 years later before Apple got that technology, mm. and they had it in 1984. Wow, and didn't know it. So like almost like Xerox, Xerox had it. Didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it had the multi. You yeah yeah, and you already saw the 
the need for that. And well, I, I hired, you know, half of my team at HP yeah. who were building computers right. that had multitasking. Right. So we just, we, you know, we built the future. And, you know, part of the challenge for us was I told my team to design as if, as if a memory was free. Mm. But if you, if you think about it in those days, there's not a picture, but there used to be a, a hard disk drive with called the profile. It was like this. It was like a boat anchor. It was five megabytes and it cost a thousand dollars for five megabytes. For five megabytes. <laughs> and I needed I needed the disk to make that operating system work. And but we were just the hardware was way, way ahead. Yeah. I mean, we were way the software was way ahead of, what, of the hardware. The hardware yeah. 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 Um, in fact, I believe at the museum at the end of the month, I think it's 29th, we are giving the operating systems away. Wow. For free, the Lisa operating system. Oh, cool! And I, I still have an a Lisa, and it and it runs. Um, it runs. It, it runs. It's, so it's, it's a little it's, bit hokey now the days, you know, because the, the graphics are like, you know, you show that to the, like, uh, some of you guys, and you're going, wow, this is ugly. Yeah. You know, but it it uh, it was quite a quite a challenge in those in those days, and uh, we sold fifty thousand of them. At ten thousand dollars a piece, yeah. so you can, you know, we, right. we made the money back, yeah. but, yeah. but, uh, yeah, they're collector's items now. Yeah. So, and so, you, but you already, you always had a passion for education. Uh, well, I, I, there's a few things that Apple did that was really interesting. There was um, uh, the nights, the student nights at the Apple. Yeah, Store I mean, what, Apple, yeah, Apple well, University. Well, uh, I guess you know, the past for education kind of came because, you know, I went to high school like everybody else. Now I'm National Honor Society, and you know, I I learned how to memorize. Right. And I memorized my way through school all the yeah. way to my junior year when I walked into the physics final exam, and there was one question, and it was to spend it was to, uh, um, the spinning top, you know, um, uh, spinning top in free space, right, right, the you know, the, the uh, codes and everything for it. And uh, it had never been covered in the book and it hadn't been covered in the lecture or in the TA section. And I saw a class of really smart people panic, including myself. And that was the same same semester that I took Horticulture Science 120, oh, yeah, which had to be, it. which happened to be Fortran programming, but it was the only department who could afford the computer in those days. And I And that's when I saw the difference between memorizing and what I would call challenge-based learning. Mm -hmm. And challenge-based learning is is fundamentally an umbrella for entrepreneurship. Yeah. You 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 know you, you have an unknown and you gotta figure, figure out, out how to get there. Yeah. And and programming is is like that. And so that's when I decided I, I wanted to change my major from physics to, to programming and I and I went I went there. But then I watched you know all my kids just be fundamentally act it's the same thing, you yeah. know. Memorize this, the yeah. answers to the odds are in the back of the book. And so I just, I knew there was a better way. And so um, when I had retired from Apple uh, early at 36, and I'd spent the next 10 years kind of in ministry work, uh, saving a, a Christian school, you know, I could see the talent in mm -hmm. the kids. Mm -hmm. And yet the, it was an impedance mismatch between the way we were teaching and yeah. the way the kids wanted to learn. Yeah. And especially in, in this age, we have a, a lot more visual learners mm -hmm. because a lot of their their input, if you will, is 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 visual. visual you know, yeah. Yeah. And we're still <laughs> teaching, you know, in a semantic way, right? Mm -hmm. Here's A, here's B, memorize, you know, process for me to be uh go to C, we'll send you to the, the principal's office, right? <laughs> um, and so I, you know, that that changed a lot running turning that school around and so when steve asked me to come back uh he did he go he he said well john he goes i don't know whether i'm going to have you run education because i failed education or i'm going to have you be in charge of software because you know that's i know that's your expertise that's my expertise yeah. well he he just he, and so he hired me without it without knowing what i was going to do Right. And he and he put me next to you know Phil Schiller and I had ninety days to look at the company 
you agreed without a to job. go back. I agreed to go back like without no one. Without, 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 yeah. no idea what you were going to do. Yeah. yeah. But that was, you know, I wanted to work with Steve again. Yeah. You know, and, uh, but I, so I had 90 days to look at the company, which was, thought I changed since I had been there. You know, the technology, everything was on the computer, all H, everything. Everything you on know. the computer? And what the HR, heck? HR, everything, you know, I mean, all the, it was just an entirely different world. Yeah. And um, so, and I, I, I got to go to the sales meetings and the marketing meetings, and I could see that the, in the education area that they were split and going in different directions, and there was no, there was no vision, you know, nobody could articulate why, why we were in education, mm. you know, everything was what we're going to do, and none of it led to anything. And, and just to clarify, you say in education, it was supporting uh, well, learning. K-12, through, K yeah. uh, well, K through college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and basically, they, that, were, that, that was your basically market, they were selling market. boxes, yeah, yeah, you know, without any concept of how the boxes would be used or whether they yeah. would really be mental mm -hmm. bicycles. And so Steve eventually decided, okay, I, I want, he says, I failed education. He goes, I don't know whether it's a hardware problem or, or I don't know whether it's a marketing problem or a sales problem, but if you can't fix it, we're getting out of education. So he gave me, he broke the the, the standard organization in the company was all functional. Mm. Hardware, you know, applications, mm. software, operating system, blah, blah, blah. And what he did is he took the marketing team away from the marketing manager and the sales team away from the sales team and, and said, years. you've got to yeah. run, you know? And so uh, first thing we had to do is really just, we had to create a vision. You know, I had to, I had to bring people together because, well, I... I'll tell one story because it kind of equates to that. Uh, Steve didn't know what, like I said, he didn't know whether it was a marketing problem or a sales problem. So he didn't know what to do. So he, he gave that to me. And so I realized that we had problems in both. Mm -hmm. And so we would meet every Wednesday, the team. And and uh, one Wednesday, we Steve would always, you know, he would always pontificate. He would always come in and, and, and share this 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 bit of wisdom that came to him in the middle of the night or, you know, after he smoked a joint. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he came in one morning, he goes, you know, he goes, you know, when I was running education, I really didn't know whether it was a marketing problem or a sales problem. So I, I gave the, I, I formed the division and gave it to John and, and John fired them both, <laughs> you know? And so the whole team is going, okay, are you telling me that I need to, fire half my team or whatever but the, but see it made an impact yeah. on, on Steve so I did I I fired them both and rebuilt yeah. rebuilt an organization with, with a shared vision and our vision was around the fact that this is a generation that have grown up in the digital world yeah. they are digital, digital natives, natives. Yeah. in fact my son may have been the first digital yeah. native because he sat in front of a ten thousand dollar computer at six years old right way before mm -hmm. Pretzky wrote his paper on digital natives mm -hmm. and so that was part of the communication to the schools and it says look you've got this you, you, your customer although education doesn't look at the student as a customer right they do not they look at it as a product and i said right. here you've got this talent these digital natives that that, that you're not teaching yeah. in the language that they understand and and that's where we came up with the challenge-based learning and so you know the first thing we did is when I looked at, okay, I got to build education in, in the company. Where's the company investing? I don't want to, I don't want to go in a different direction that the company's going in. So they're investing in retail stores. Mm -hmm. So how do I leverage the retail stores for education? Well, in those days, the retail stores weren't open at night. Right, that's okay. Good. So we, we created a program called um, uh, 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 school nights. School nights. Yeah where the schools could come in and get access to the computers and the students would, you know, show their, their projects. And I'll never forget the first one was in Palo Alto. Yeah. And I went in and there was this sixth grade girl and she had a baseball cap on sideways. And um, she had a, she had a video that she had done and it was like this big. And I said, um, don't you want to enlarge that video? And she goes, Oh no, I can't do that. If I do that, it'll pixelate. And I needed to send it to my partner in China tomorrow. <laughs> oh my God. Digital native, 
digital immigrant, you know, <laughs> um, but you know, that's, we started there uh, with school nights and then we did, you know, just one program yeah. after another. But, and the other one, of course, was they were investing in OS 10. Well, when I did my study, uh, I realized that only 6% of the installed Apple base in education could run OS 10. Yeah. And so I go, okay, I'm in, I'm in trouble, right? And so I was, I was sitting around with Steve and Phil Schiller one day, and I, we, was, we were trying to say, okay, what's, what, what's the solution here? Mm. And so we said, well, what if we gave every teacher in North America a free copy of OS 10? You know, to get them to take it to the IT department, to get them to. And I said, I did a calculation. I said, well, that will cost me $10 million. That's my whole marketing budget for the whole year. But, you know, free is a very powerful word. Mm -hmm. So let's do it. And so I said, Steve, I'm willing to do this. How many do you think will take us advantage of it? Take advantage of it? And he goes, well, maybe about 10, maximum 15,000. Yeah, a half a million teachers took advantage of that uh, for us. I think it was half a million. It was a lot. Yeah. And it it broke it broke the barrier. Yeah. And I I somewhere in my pile of papers, you know, someday I'll have a museum, right? Is an art is a is an email from a teacher to the IT department saying, you know. Very aggressively, you made the transition from you know the word you know to the computer and blah blah blah. You know, uh, OS ten is the best thing out there for education. You know, quit whining and do your job. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so the teachers and and and, and it, it it really goes back to the Apple II. The purchaser of the Apple II for education was the teacher. Right, right. The user. And so we the needed to user. empower the yeah. the teachers again. And I think if we've made a mistake or we were negligent, we let Google give free email mm. to the teacher. And that's how they, they got in. They, there were two things. They gave them free email and I mm. couldn't get Apple to give free email. I was, apparently it was too expensive. And then the second thing was when it came time to do the, um, you know, the testing, mm -hmm. Microsoft spent $2.6 billion Billion. thinking they were going to get the computer to do the testing well the cheapest thing out there was was the google's device and so the schools bought the cheapest thing they could do to to adhere to the requirements of testing so now you've got every teacher familiar with google because of email yeah. and you got a boatload of hardware that was on that it's only used for testing yeah what do you do with it yeah and so it kind of streamed into the into mm. the educational system and then they convinced people that you know web-based solutions are simpler than app-based solutions mm. and so you know if if we made a mistake it was our inability to be able to convince people that the app-based environment even though more complicated for the it department was better for With education yeah, yeah 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 um so let's see uh yeah questions sorry let's open it up to questions yeah i got a, a quick question a uh, couple questions first one uh what year did you leave apple and then kind of since then since you were actively there now what's sort of your sentiment or opinions on where the company is at today versus when you were there and uh last question is if you were a new new grad or say young working professional today would you see yourself going to work at Apple given where it is now compared to when you were there? Yeah, all good, all good questions. I think I, about two years ago, I retired. Um, and it's it's still kind of strange and kind of how that happened. So I had gotten permission to write this book. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and Apple, yeah, Apple doesn't really like its people writing books, okay? And uh, you just and, spent a year writing it. And I had I had written it, and it was done, and it was scheduled to be released in May. And um, my boss at the time kind of came to me and said, uh, uh, "Apple doesn't really want you writing books. Uh, how about if you go on a contractor base?" instead. And so I thought, well, there is a certain advantage to a contractor because you can create your own pension plan and 
and save a lot of taxes and and I'm still doing what I was yeah. doing. And, it was like, as an employee, yeah. I want you to write a book, but yeah. as an independent contractor. Yeah, could so I could do that. Yeah. Do, yes. So I said, okay. So yeah. that's how I kind of started to move, move my way out. And uh, so the, the irony, of course, is, the, yeah, like yeah. And then when I finally, just when I finally mm -hmm. decided to, you know, I was 73 years old, it's time to, time to kind of move on. And uh, I remember Tim Cook, and they threw a big, sales event thank you and this video for me my life at apple and all and, and tim cook said you know gee john um i thought i would leave much sooner than you and i found that a little bit bizarre because he had to sign he had to sign the papers that you know that allowed me to do all this stuff so it was it was just it was mm. a strange mm. strange things but tim cook is an incredible ceo both, I think, is not the visionary that Steve is, but he understands. And um, and and Steve, I mean, Tim could could look at a, a twenty page spreadsheet and find the one error. Mm. I mean, you know, he came out of manufacturing; he's really top operation guy. So the company's is has got a lot of talent, and they they have a lot of talent at the other end too, in terms of the engineering, because they still can mm. attract that because they let people you know, create things. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the stuff that Steve gets credit and should get credit for it coming out to the market really came from ideas from people within yeah. the company. Yeah. You know, um, Tony Fadal, you know, and the iPhone and things of that nature. But um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, there is, there is there are two things I want to say relating to, you know, the direction. You know, um, I'm old enough now to have, you know, read and been in certain business books by Tom Peters where it says, you know, stick to your knitting. You know, it says, don't get into anything you know anything about. Well, that the iPhone is a perfect example of Apple not sticking to their knitting. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing which we talked a little bit about was we never looked at market share. Because, you know, market share is, and I learned this lesson at HP, because when HP built the first handheld calculator, it was called the HP 35, it adds, subtracted, multiplied, divided in reverse Polish, cost $395, and the market research came back and said, don't build it because nobody wants it. Well, Bill Hewlett said, I want it, and furthermore, I want it to fit in my share market. <laughs> Nine months later, it was $180 million business, and the side rail companies were out of business. And so market research is only valid in an existing market. Oh, yeah. So, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, is Ralph Waldo Emerson, where he says, people only see what they're prepared to see. You know, you remember when they asked Henry Ford, you know, and Henry Ford said, well, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. <laughs> okay. But you think about innovation and creativity because, you know, on the first glance, you know, the automobile required infrastructure. It required roads. It required insurance companies. It required gas stations. It required, you know, just this whole world. So you can be a little too early, yeah. you know, with an innovation and the infrastructure and the roads aren't there. I think that Lisa was a, probably a, a good example of that. It, it set the tone for the future, but the, the environment, if you will, wasn't quite there. So, and I think that's yeah. why uh, Musk, gave all his technology away yeah, because he realized that him alone wasn't going to make the transition from the gas engine to the electric car because of the infrastructure required to, su to, support. to support that yeah, yeah. that innovation so what okay so that is a question sorry sorry i'm jumping because what do that's something that was one of the questions that came up early is you talk about okay you can't rely on market research when you're creating brand new markets right and yeah. we we train our startups, our founders, okay, customer development, go do your interviews, go yeah. do the research. But so what do you rely on? I mean, is it like- is Well, it, you, just told go, you just told them to go in a direction where the answer may have been in the other direction. Yeah. You know, um, at your instinct, you know. Is it, is it yeah, instinct, yeah. is it gut, is it, you know, because you're- It can be anything, it can be anything. It can be, you know, it can be seeing a, a need in the that, future that the yeah. market isn't addressing yeah 
um, which I think a lot of the stuff that I see at Cal, uh, Cal Poly, you know, your program, you know, you, you saw a need, the market's not addressing, you know, go for it. Now you have to realize, you know, I, one of the first things that I did when I got to Apple is I drew the, I just, I'm a big slide guy. So, and Steve was just the opposite. In fact, you'd never presented to Steve with slides ever. Uh, if you, you had 30 seconds to get your ideas across or he took in charge, but I drew this minefield and I, and I, you know, in the minefield, I showed these giant footprints and I said, you know, we got two choices. You can follow the well-worn footsteps or you can pave your own path, maybe to a richer area on the other side of the minefield, but it's a risk and anything entrepreneurial is a risk. Uh, and you have to have the passion, the patience, uh, you know, to stick to what mm. you believe. Mm. Uh, if you, you know, I mean, people, I mean, Steve, you know, Steve sold his van, Waz sold his calculator. I mean, people give up everything, right? Yeah. And to, to stick to their, you know, their thoughts, their yeah, ideas, their passion. Yeah. And I don't think, yeah. you know, sometimes I wish people in the world understood the sacrifices that, you know, people who are now maybe very wealthy today, they just see the wealth. They don't see the journey. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we used to say that, you know, the reward's in the journey. The reward is in the journey. So my, my, maybe my journey didn't sell 2 million, but the reward, the people, right. the, the people that I st that stay in touch with me today uh, because it changed their lives, that's the, the real reward. I've got a fellow that, that I didn't realize this until, until recently, but he was at MIT. He was 30 days away from getting his PhD. I interviewed him in my car in a gas line in the 80s. You guys are all too young, but we used to have to wait in line to get gas during the Carter administration. And he came to work for me. And I only recently did I did he tell me that he gave up his PhD to come work for me. Yeah. And he eventually went back to get his PhD and he's on the state water board now. Huh. But that's we the passion was so yeah. great that surrounded our culture. I think I went 80 something engineers in a row before I Somebody said no, mm. you know, mm. and we were asking them to, you know, take pay cuts yeah, yeah, to do yeah. it, to do everything. Now, I did do one thing, which I learned from Steve. Anybody who came to work for me got a free Apple too. Ah, there you go. So they could take it, they could take it home, show their wives and show their parents, they show their kids, you know, what it was that they were working on. Because believe me, my family did had no clue of what I was doing at doing, Apple. Yeah. yeah. No well, so on that note, um, it is past our time, and, and I know I want to be mindful of everyone's time. A uh, great, great place to end the rewards in the journey. Uh, but feel free to stay with us. Yeah, I definitely would do that. Uh, I'm sure uh, people here in the audience would love to Let me, uh, stay and yeah, I will do that. Let me just ask because there's an old, there's a social philosopher by the name of Eric Hoffer, uh -huh. and he goes, In times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Mm. Okay. And so that's, you know, that's the, you know, that's the Holy grail. Um, can I, can I benefit the world? Is my product, is my product going to change people's lives? And, mm -hmm. and we didn't get into the model, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I find that why is more important than what, why you do something. My friend Simon mm -hmm. Sinek, written mm. a book called start with the why i start everything with the why mm. you know mm. you know are you saving lives are you what is the why because the why will last just like it's lasted mm. at apple because of what's changed yeah right yeah, what's gone changes. from personal computers yeah. to ipods to iphones to watches to probably internal automobile management you know mm. so start with the, the why. why yeah cool Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for having me. So, uh, quick updates of uh, regarding upcoming events: AngelCon uh, applications open up January seventeenth. 
Uh, so if anyone is seeking funding, uh, it's an incredible experience. Lots of companies have gotten funded through this program. Uh, apply starting January 17th. And then our next coffee and conversation uh, is on February 8th. And also a wonderful, amazing guy, George Dom. He's with ACI Jet, ex um, US Navy. Uh, Another book involved with this, uh, two books actually, which we'll bring in and I'll refer to, but um, he's created a, a business metho methodology that was applied in uh, Iraq. And when they realized that they couldn't deal with on the ground with issues the way they had been dealing with them in the military for you know hundreds of years. And so he changed the whole methodology on how to work on the ground in that environment and how it, that is, uh, this methodology can be applied in business to, to, for incredible outcomes. It, it's fascinating. Uh, so I encourage you to come and uh, hear George next month. Thanks, John. Thanks again. So great to have you.